It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 113, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today, Josh Slotnick, has farmed at Clark Fork Organics on the outskirts of Missoula, Montana, with his wife, Kim Murchison, since 1992. With about eight acres in vegetables and 11 acres of total crop ground, Clark Fork Organics is a pillar in the Missoula local foods community and is well known for their salad green production. They sell at two farmer's markets through a local health food store and to restaurants in the community. In 1996, Josh and a few others founded Garden City Harvest, a nonprofit in Missoula that builds community through agriculture. Garden City Harvest does this by providing community education while managing 10 community garden sites and four neighborhood farms in Missoula. Josh is the director of Garden City Harvest's largest farm, the Pease Farm, that's P-E-A-S Farm, which is a partnership between Garden City Harvest and the University of Montana's Environmental Studies Program. Josh digs deep into how Clark Fork Organics builds and maintains relationships with their restaurant clients, both during the short, intense growing season and over the winter when the farm doesn't operate. We also discuss how these same techniques spill over to the farmer's market and how they've used those relationships to keep a marketing edge as the local food scene has grown up around them. And Josh shares the many ways that Peas Farm and Garden City Harvest have contributed to the overall social ecology of Missoula. We also talk at length about salad mix production at Clark Fork Organics, as well as their irrigation tools and strategies, and how Josh juggles two farms, family, and friends. By the way, this episode was recorded on March 9th, which is kind of like a lifetime ago in weather terms. So when you hear us talking about pond hockey, that might provide a little context. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop-growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high-quality compost and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com And by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easier to work with your buyers, saving time, reducing errors, and increasing your capacity to work with more buyers overall. Farmersweb.com. Josh Slotnick, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. I'm glad to be talking with you. Really glad you could join us today. I'd like to start off with having you kind of set the stage for us. And and I, I normally would say I'd like you to set the stage for us at Clark Fork Organics, but then I'd have to say, well, I want you to set the stage for us at Clark Fork Organics and Garden City Harvest and and a whole bunch of other things. But so maybe just give us the 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 stage for Josh Slotnick. Sure. Thanks. That's a great way. Of, great way to get me going. So uh, I, I'm a partner in a couple things. And the first one that uh, you mentioned is with Clark Fork Organics Farm, and that's our family farm. And we've been in operation for, gosh, 20 some odd years now. I think we started up, our first season was in uh, 1992. And then a few years after that was going, in fact, it was going maybe, I think, uh, 96 to 97. It was during that winter. I was part of a small group of people. And there were three of us that started a small food security nonprofit in Missoula called Garden City Harvest. And our first big project with Garden City Harvest was to get a farm going in partnership with the university called the Peas Farm, P-E-A-S. And the farm is a really interesting hybrid in terms of student farms in that uh, the university supplies me as a teacher and a farm manager and sends the students and the students earn credit for being there. But the operating expenses and the lease on the land are held by the nonprofit Garden City Harvest. And both these things have grown and changed over the years and really uh, taken on lives that are way larger than I could have ever imagined uh, <laughs> 20 some odd years ago. I feel really fortunate that those things have happened. So I'm sitting at my house right now in the seat of uh, Park Fork Organics, um, where there's, we see we've got two acres behind our house and then a nine acre field around the corner. Uh, my wife really runs things, but I work here uh, Wednesday afternoon in the summer, Friday afternoons, uh, and on the weekends. So it's pretty it's pretty much of a seven-day-a-week life. And then the main part of the week, I'm working at the Peas Farm uh, for Garden City Harvest and uh, the Environmental Studies Program at the University of Montana. So I feel like I'm working with people and farming every day, just about, and it's uh, a full and rewarding life. I do want to note, we, we did ask if your wife, Kim, wanted to be on the show today, and she, she actually took a pass on that. Yeah, and she said she's a, a fan and, and listens to the podcast, 
and is also shy and had no interest in talking. <laughs> was excited to listen. <laughs> right. So now I I looked up Clark Fork Organics on the on the Google hey. map, and you guys yeah. are farming, you know, in town there in Missoula, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really I think part of our strengths as a business. So we are right on the edge of city limits. So close, really, that when I go to the peas farm for my other day job, I can ride my bike. It takes like 30, 35 minutes, depending on how fast they go. So we're we're really close. And we started this up, like I said, in the early 90s when local food was just just beginning. And we were able to make use of our proximity by basically bringing handfuls of vegetables into restaurateurs and grocery stores saying, would you buy some of this? Um, because the idea at that point of buying locally was brand new. Nobody had really heard of it. It seemed kind of, a, it, was, it was definitely a foreign concept. And this was long before local, local distributors and growers co-ops and institutional buying, and even really before CSAs were a uh, well-known thing. So for us being able to almost go door to door with restaurants and grocery stores saying, hey, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. Are you interested? Um, our proximity made a lot of that possible. So when you started doing that in 1992, were you intending to grow this into a business or was this just something that you guys were doing out of your backyard and had some extra vegetables and thought you'd peddle? No, we were, we were fully hoping to do this as a business. Um, we had, we met each other at the UC Santa Cruz farm and garden program where so many people who do this type of work uh, found their start. And I'd been there the summer before as an apprentice and uh, my wife Kim had been there the summer before as a second year kind of a teaching assistant and before that she'd been an apprentice and at the end of my year and we met there uh, at the end of my year um, we were both convinced we wanted to be with each other and be farming and uh, I'd gone to college here in Missoula a handful of years before going to California to work on the, at the UCSC farm. And when we were trying to consider where we wanted to go, where we wanted to live, uh, especially after being in Santa Cruz, which is a nice place, but really crowded, I said, you know, Missoula, Montana is really great. It's beautiful. It doesn't cost that much money to live there. And there's really nobody doing this. So let's try that. So we came back. For me, it was coming back. And for Kim, it was coming to for the first time. So we came here fully with the intention of uh, starting something up. Uh, and we didn't have very much money. Uh, and we ended up, because of that, we started really small, which seemed like a good way to go. We didn't have to borrow anything. We just started small, and it, the, the thing grew over time. And our needs were small when we started, too, which helps a lot. Yeah, no kids makes a big difference with that, doesn't it? Yeah, no kids, and we didn't feel like we needed any anything, really. You know, we just, just a farm uh, seemed like the greatest gift. Uh, and we were very lit up by it, and we were young and full of energy. And I think just the act of doing this um, and doing it, and, and it was so new, uh, was really uh, not just fulfilling, but it was kind of fuel for the fire, actually. Uh, that People were saying, what are you doing? What is that? As opposed to now it might be, I think it might be a little more difficult in that there's farms everywhere and, and people have heard of it and the market is uh, full and it's competitive. This was like we were doing a brand new thing. And uh, it wasn't that we had competition with other farmers. We had competition with food from California or the idea that this wasn't even possible. And I think that was fuel to fire us up. And so we had very little expectations for what was going to happen. Uh, it was just fully open. And I think that made it easy too. I think that Missoula is known as the garden city in Montana. Is that right? Yeah, 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 it sure is. And and really this is because for, for Western Montana, especially, we have a fairly mild climate, not compared to many places in the United States, but for Montana. And Missoula is this beautiful valley, uh, ringed in mountains. And uh, there's part of the west, west side of the valley has beautiful soil. And we're really rich in groundwater, not so much in rainfall. It rains 12 inches or so a year. But we've got a great uh, set of irrigation ditches and rivers and lakes. And, uh, so it's set up to, for agriculture to some degree. And then not to some degree, and that most of the land in Missoula County is steep and, and, and it's uh, federal land and you couldn't grow on it. So land for agriculture is somewhat dear. But way back when that name came about more than 100 years ago, there weren't that many people here and there wasn't a, a land to, uh, to farm. And a lot of the vegetables that were grown in Missoula and the Bitterroot Valley just south of here were 
trucked over the mountains to Butte, which at that point was the biggest city in Montana and had this huge thriving population of mine workers that needed to eat good food. So this part of the state grew the vegetables for that part of the state. So I think that's where the name came from. And you can still see remnants of this in the part of town that we live in is divided up into these five, 10 and some 20 acre chunks. They were all kind of as a plan to be uh, truck farms, market farms, small orchards. You know, this, this was the plan 1900 or so. And now they, for the most part, grow cul-de-sacs and modern houses. Wow. But there's, there's still some of these chunks of land around. And the modern, the current incarnation of Missoula, I feel like actually matches up with that name quite well. And that now we have two thriving farmers markets, uh, a couple really great food security and local food advocacy organizations, um, a giant in, independently owned natural food grocery store, uh, a, a couple of major public farms, um, all in a city that has you know, 70, 75,000 people in it. I think we have the, a lot of the accoutrements of the local food system that you'd expect to see in a city like Portland or something. We've got them here in Missoula, Montana. Now, I know a lot of towns in the mountains are are somewhat isolated when it comes to the food system. You know, I mean, I lived up in Aspen for a couple of years back in the God, way early 90s. Well, I guess about the time you guys were getting started and and and, you know, you just didn't get a lot of fresh food up there. It wasn't you know, we were at the end of the distribution route. Are you guys in a similar situation there in Missoula or is there plenty of fresh produce coming into town? Yeah, there's, de- there's definitely fresh produce. I mean, we're on a major, major interstate and it's getting trucked in every, you know, mo- every moment, <laughs> just about, uh, there are big trucks coming into town, bringing all the things you would find anywhere. So though we are a mountain town, we're right on this highway and here in the lower 48. So, um, I don't feel like we're isolated, uh, from, all that the giant international food system has to provide. It's, it's all here. So Josh, you said that Missoula is a pretty mild climate for Montana. Right. What does right. that actually mean in terms of your growing conditions there? Oh, okay. That's a, that's a good question. So our last frost is the end of May, early June. And our first, and our first frost is a little more variable. For us, it could be anywhere from mid September to uh, you know, the first week of October. So that's not too long of a growing season. And then the other, I think the main defining feature of our, of our climate is our dryness. So, and that's that less than 12 inches of rain a year. And what this really means for us is that during the summertime, we could have plenty of days that are in the low 90s or even the mid 90s, sometimes cracking 100. And the nights that correspond with those days could still be in the 50s or even the 40s. Because we don't have rain, we don't have humidity. As you know, humidity holds heat, just like a lake effect, but it's a lake in the air. <laughs> so without that water in the air, we get uh, a climate that's a little more like a desert. And then we have really huge temperature swings between day and night. And what this means in terms of growing vegetables is that even though it can be blazing hot during the day, the temperatures or the average temperatures are quite low. So that may mean you know, an average temperature of 70 or something, even in the heat of the summer. So for us to grow heirloom tomatoes outside is pretty much impossible. Uh, so on the positive side, we don't have a whole lot of the fungal rots and diseases and, and, and pest complexes that you would find in the Northeast or the Northwest or the Southeast or the Midwest. Uh, we just don't have them. And that makes growing vegetables in a sense a little bit easier, but the climatic parameters are pretty tight in terms of how long our seasons are. And we have to be super careful about uh, varietal choices in order to get success. And we also do a bunch of stuff with hoop houses too. But I don't feel like it's really limiting. I feel like these are just the parameters we have. Every place has got their own. I also worked on a farm in in Santa Barbara, again, at about the same time you were in Santa Cruz. And sometimes I've wondered now living in the Midwest, like why I left the avocado farm. I know. <laughs> yeah. 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 I have a distinct memory of uh, walking through some snow so it's the end of May, and, and a friend who was driving by our farm, he pulled over and rolled down his window, and he said, uh, you know, you, you moved here of your own free will. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I got it. <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, I, I like these parameters, and then I feel like the weather is often easier to deal with than some of the pests and diseases we might have in a warmer and more humid climate. Now, you mentioned you're doing some 
high tunnel production. Are you using yeah, that for, for, sure. for season extension into the winters as well, or is that primarily based around season extension in the summer? It's, it's for us, it's just season extension in the summer, though a person could. And then really that's because of the life we want to lead. And it's nice to uh, have the winter break. But I did it with some students. We did a trial one year where we did that kind of Elliot Coleman style of late summer, early fall seeding of Asian greens. We did it under Rime in a hoop house. And then and it, they grew and they looked good. And then we made kind of a plastic tent over the over these beds that had Rime in them inside the hoop house. And we were able to harvest these Asian greens well into January. I mean, we, we ate them all before uh, the season crushed them, even when it was zero degrees outside. So a person could do that, but it's not anything we've chosen to do. On the wintertime, we really like to ski and play pond hockey. So we do that instead of harvest Asian greens. Nice, nice. And and so tell me how you're marketing your, your produce there in Missoula. Yeah, so so our marketing, uh, there are, we have about a, a handful of channels that we sell through, and then each sort of marketing the marketing corresponds to those channels. So we sell to a handful of restaurants right now. I think there's five or six. And for marketing, in this case, really, it's all about relationship. And that means staying in good touch with the chefs who run these restaurants and uh, you know, being in touch a few times during the winter and letting them know we're ready to go in the spring, uh, intro letters and phone calls saying this is what we have to offer. And really, we try and do one good conversation in the winter things. So anything different you're, you're after this year, anything we can do for you. And these guys at this point, these chefs have so many options at their disposal for beautiful local food. We have a really vibrant, super successful growers co-op here and plenty of local farms. So they don't, it's not like we're the only game in town by any stretch, which uh, we sort of were for selling to, to small restaurants a long time ago. So marketing for us is also blended in with service. So that means really trying to meet the needs of the people we sell to and lots of personal touch during the season. So that's, it, it's kind of customer service and it's kind of marketing all at the same time. And then we work with this one major natural food grocery store called the Good Food Store, which is as big, if not bigger and more beautiful than any Whole Foods you'd see anywhere. And it's locally owned by, by a nonprofit that has a strong community commitment. For us, marketing with them really means being in really good touch with the person who runs their deli and the person who runs the produce department and trying to meet their needs. And those guys are accommodating and they have really major obligations to meet given the customer base they have. So it behooves us to work really closely and to listen. Then our other marketing is that we do two farmer's markets a week. Uh, so Missoula is rich in local food system stuff. So we have two farmer's markets both on Saturday mornings down the street from each other and both well attended. And we set up uh, tables and stands at each of those. And there again, service and marketing are kind of blended, trying to figure out what our customers want and be chatty and uh, try and be helpful and have a wide array of beautiful food right there. That's, that's it. So we don't do advertising per se. Uh, it's really just relationship and staying in good touch and trying to listen and anticipate what people's needs might be. Tell me what that actually looks like when you're dealing with your restaurants and your grocery store accounts, because I mean, it's, it's easy to say communication and being in touch yeah, and, yeah, and providing yeah. good service, but how does that actually manifest for you? Yeah, I mean, for us, really what that looked like is a couple of times during the winter, sitting down uh, at a restaurant with the chef and with a crop list and asking them, you know, is there anything here that, that you that we want to do differently? Uh, anything you want to experiment with? Um, uh, how can, wh what do you, what do you anticipate for the coming year? And really, how can we be part of that? And so it's really literally sitting across the table from people. And, and also it's trying to be aware of what's going on in terms of trends in other parts of the country and like, Oh, everybody's doing you know, X. Well, should we be looking in on that too? Uh, for us, the one that's really jumped up in the recent past is around packaging. And this isn't to the restaurants, but it's to the grocery stores. That for years, we sold salad mix in bulk, and the store would sell it in bulk. And then it started arriving in clamshells from California in the wintertime. And uh, another grower was selling things in little bags. I'm like, wow, so we need to, we need to keep up, <laughs> in a sense. And for us, really, that means trying to stay aware of what's going on in other places and uh, being as up-to-date as we can. 
on the first part of it, which is way more fun and interesting, it's remaining in contact with people that we share values with and share a town with. So it's it's not difficult. It's pretty pleasant. Uh, Missoula is a very community-oriented, uh, fairly self-reflective place. So it's really enjoyable to feel like we're in the same economic and cultural boat with our friends who run restaurants and our produce managers. Like we, we are in it together. And so how do you actually conduct those communications during the growing season? Are you doing that via phone call, email, fax? We're on the phone. That's on the phone. Yeah. And, and a little bit in person too, because we deliver these things. And this is, I, I feel like the, my buddy Steve Elliott at Lifeline Farm said we may have lived through the, the golden age in the nineties, and early two thousands of, uh, of small farming where we could deal very directly. Uh, now we have this growers co-op that's fantastic and is, it does great work, especially for growers who live farther away, where they can uh, buy from multiple growers who live farther out of town, aggregate the food, and behave much more like a conventional uh, vegetable distributor and sort of be a one-stop shop for restaurants and grocery stores. That's the that's the Western Montana Growers Cooperative, Western right? Western Montana Growers Co-op, yeah, yeah. And we predate the Growers Co-op. Uh, so we have these longstanding relationships, and which is really wonderful in that uh, we get to deliver this food, which can be a hassle, but we're so close to town, it's not a hassle. But really what that means is you're handing a box or multiple boxes, hopefully multiple boxes to people, and you can chat with them, even if it's for two or three minutes, just a hello, hey, what's going on, how are you doing? And there's eye contact, and you know, call somebody by their first name, and you get that sense again that we are in it together. This is our local economy and our local food system. And there's something to selling it to a distributor where you lose that a little bit. They, they get that with the, grow, with the, with the rep, reps of the growers call, but we don't get that as farmers. And I'm really glad that we started when we did so we can maintain that. So right now, uh, the growers call fills that, that niche so much that if we, you couldn't start and do that right now, uh, and, and I think in lots of cities, this is the way that, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, people were doing what we were doing, peddling food directly to stores, restaurants. Uh, but now that uh, you know, aggregators with a conscience have taken a, on a, a larger part of that role, and I think done a great job in that they've infiltrated the food system far greater than we ever could. But something was lost there for farmers in that we don't get that uh, really close contact with the people who are buying our food other than at farmer's market. And I'm really glad we still get to do that. And like I said, that's through very old fashioned talking on the phone, uh, asking what, what you want and then interacting when we deliver it. And that happens twice a week. And we do, we don't even do much of that over email. It's almost all on the phone. And and that isn't because we don't like email. It's uh, just because it's, it's the way we've done it for years. And I think the people we interact with appreciate that. Uh, We often find ourselves on the phone saying, so do you want the same thing as last week? And then they'll say, well, what else do you have? What's going on? So, wow. You know, the bok choy is beautiful or, uh, you know, this latest crop for arugula is really great and we sell extra things. And then the person who we're selling to kind of knows that they got the, you know, the latest stuff that was ready. So it's not just a stale spreadsheet. And how about at farmer's market? You mentioned the importance of that communication and service there as well. What are you doing to stand out? Because I imagine that you've you've had some of the same pressures. And you talk about starting off as the local farmer in the early 1990s, and now you know two farmers markets. And I'm and I've seen pictures of the of of at least one of the farmers markets in Missoula. They're not small markets. No, these things are booming, and you're totally right around the competition. <clears throat> it's huge. I mean. I feel like given reasonable vegetable parameters, a person can get just about whatever they want of the absolute highest quality on any given Saturday during the growing season. And the growers here do just a spectacular job. So competition is really stiff. And and we have our little niche. And really our niche I feel like is based on that kind of relationship. Um, I feel like I, I, am, I am personally am part of people, a handful of people's Saturday morning ritual where they go down to the market and they buy stuff and we chat a little bit and ask them how their week was. And, and it's very genuine. This isn't an affectation or a marketing technique. These are people I know. I don't know super well, but they're a part of my Saturday morning and I'm part of theirs. And that doesn't happen even at the very best of stores. So we, we get to continue on, I think, because we've become part of people's lives or uh, in, a, in a small but meaningful way. And, and I keep saying this, like we're the sense that we're in it together, but I really feel that at market. And I think some of our customers do too. 
And I think the same thing is happening at many of our friends' stands as well. The city has grown in the same kind of people making, visiting certain specific farms part of their Saturday morning ritual. It's, uh, that's part of the deal. And so for us, that means having having one of the markets and one of our kids oh, at the other markets on somewhat regular basis so that uh, customers see the same face and have a sense of who's there and uh, a sense that um, you know, we're in it just like they are. Just to swing a little bit back to the growing, then you said that you guys have about two acres at home and, a, and then a nine acre field around the corner. How much of that are you actually farming vegetables on? So the, the entire two behind our house and then say six to seven acres around the corner. And, and a lot of that is a uh, uh, lettuce, lettuce mix or salad mix. That's uh, that's our main, one of our main crops. And we do all the other veg, you know, most of the other vegetables you need to sell at farmer's market. Uh, and then a, a few that we do in larger quantities for uh, the growers co-op or for uh, the good food store. What kinds of things are you doing in larger quantities for the growers cooperative? Oh, I think so for the growers co-op, we do, um, see, we did larger amounts of chard and kale, uh, celery, uh, fennel, uh, and then, uh, and then, and then lots of lettuce mix for the growers co-op. And, and the growers co-op also has a, a quite a large CSA, and we we're part of the set of growers that grow for uh, the growers co-op CSA as well. I think they have 230 plus members now. So with that salad mix being such an important crop, and especially being something that's hard to grow at at a profit, especially when you're talking about selling it to a wholesale distributor like the growers right. co-op, can we talk a little bit about how you're actually doing that production? Sure. So for um, the growers co-op, uh, we sell a lettuce mix, which for us we found is just a lot easier to grow. And and really that's because um, the baby brassicas that are part of the salad mix, like baby brassicas in most places, are really vulnerable to flea beetle damage. And the flea beetles are pretty intense here. So for our baby brassicas, we end up keeping the beds covered in reme right up until the point of harvest. And if there's even a little tiny little hole in the reme, the flea beetles find their way in where, and then you get one cutting. Whereas with the lettuce mix, um, they're not bothered by, we don't have any pests that bother them. And we, they don't have to live their whole lives under reme and we get multiple cuttings. So we do, we do the lettuce mix for the growers co-op and we do the salad mix with the baby brassicas mixed in uh, for a higher price for uh, the good food store and for some of the restaurants. And that's in a, a smaller quantity. So, and that's, those are seeded in what looks like a buddy of mine called it a uh, salad carpet. So we use cedars and you know, coat the bed with, I think there's like nine to 13 lines of seed in a bed. So it really is covered. They start their lives under ream may. And then uh, we cut sometimes with scissors and sometimes with uh, that farmer's friend uh, the, with the drill and the bandsaw blade. Uh, harvest that into totes, um, weigh them, put them in a cooler next to the field. And then when we get the weight that we're after, we haul them from the cooler next to the field over to the cooler and wash station by our house. And then they get mixed, washed, put in three pound bags and boxes, and then they go back into the cooler and then delivered to where they're, where they're supposed to go. And that happens three times a week during the season that takes up you know, the first half of the day, uh, pretty much cutting and then, and then washing and sorting, boxing, and then that deliveries go out. Um, I've told, I've said this to plenty of people who are you know, interviewing to be potential workers that uh, it's, a, it's a, a vegetable farm and uh, you know, they get kind of Wendell Berry-ish images and it's actually super fast paced. And our, our farm lives during the week are really ruled by schedule. And when does this delivery have to go out and who's coming to pick up what? And, uh, fast, fast, fast. Uh, and it's fun and great conversation. Uh, when I, I go by that lettuce cutting area, there's always people out there chatting, talking. Um, my wife's right in the thick of it, kind of going three times as fast as anybody else could imagine. And uh, they seem like they're, you know, people are laughing, it's light, but they're moving really fast. And about how many pounds of salad are you producing on any one of those given harvest days? Oh my gosh, that's a good question. I mean, it could, it could, you know, it's, it's not, it's not uh, industrial scale, but for us, it's a big deal. So, I mean, it could be 
you know, 80 pounds or it could be 250 pounds on a, on a Friday. Okay. So, wow. I mean, not a, yeah. a not insignificant amount. Yeah, it's not at all. And given the, you know, the dollar values, um, were bigger years ago. And then when this got more and more popular and then in, in, uh, larger industrial machines for cutting and, you know, earthbound farms came into existence, the price of these things dropped considerably, um, but it's still well worth it for us given the two things. One, that we're, oh, we have a small amount of land and that we're really close to town. And I think if you combine those two, the salad mix makes good sense for us. Well, and it being so close to town makes it pretty easy for you guys to get that three times a week delivery, which really does make it into a premium product. Exactly. Exactly. You're totally right. Where if we had to drive two hours there and back and then spend an hour driving in traffic, it would not, a lot of this might not be worth it, but we can send somebody and, you know, with, with you know, enough boxes to stuff a Subaru and they're back in an hour it's, and we do that three times a week. It, it totally adds up and it uh, dollar wise, it fully works uh, and it's worth the time. Now, when you're seeding that lettuce mix, are you seeding mm -hmm. that as a blend, or do you seed each year varieties individually? No, each each variety individually. Okay. So um, um it's now do like I said, a series of lettuces and a series of baby brassicas, but that's not a purchased blend. Um, Kim does that, okay. just lettuces and then brassicas. And what are you using to seed those? So she's got a, a couple, a handful of different seeders. You know that. Uh, Earthway cedar, uh, kind of a Jang cedar, and then uh, a Planet Junior. All uh, and and she's got this down to a finely honed science in a way that works for her. And they know that every farm and every farmer comes up with kind of the the recipe that works for them. And this is what's worked for her is to use those cedars. And they're divided among crops. And I can even tell you because it's her it's her crop as to which ones she does with which cedar. But she'll have these cedars all set up next to the bed and tubs full of seeds and switching in and out. And, uh, and she basically just about runs pushing these cedars. Uh, it's kind of an amazing thing. Uh, and it, and she seeds twice a week. Seeding twice a week. Yeah. Seeds twice a week. And that schedule is intense. I mean, and we really have to have to meet the schedule. And this is a positive here in that it doesn't rain because if it rained, if we got, yeah, if it rained at an untimely point uh, and it would be difficult to meet that schedule three weeks to four weeks later when we were supposed to be harvesting we wouldn't have what people wanted and for us to remain competitive at one time that meant with california and, and now it means with a very competitive local food market we have to be able to provide our vendors who are also our friends uh, with these greens two or three times a week every week from june through october and and we can't stumble because uh, if we stumble, someone else will kind of crawl over our backs and fill that hole. So, um, and maintaining the seeding schedule quite rigorously means that we can maintain that harvest schedule as well. What are you doing about weed control in those dense, densely seeded beds? So, yeah, um, what we do, we, we irrigate with uh, hand lines. So these are uh, two inch hand lines. They're, uh, they're 30 foot pipe with a, a, a two foot riser and a rainbird sprinkler on top that shoots 60 feet in a 60 foot circle. And I'm bringing this all up because this ties into how we do weed control. So I till up and make beds in a block, a one irrigation block. So it's 60 feet across and then we irrigate. And as soon as we start irrigating, the weeds come up. And then when after the, and it comes, it happens pretty quickly. And uh, as soon as the weeds come up, I go over the block with a, a flame weeder and have a flame weeder attached to the back of the tractor and then go through and, and then Kim goes through and seeds. Uh, and then as they're picking, uh, cutting, if they have to uh, weed, weed, but if, if, if all the timing works right, the flame weeder does a really good job. And then the, the other, uh, other factor here is the density of the plantings, which are so tight. There's not a lot of room uh, for weeds to get in there. Right. So if you can get those lettuces up ahead of the weeds, there's yeah. not going to be new ones coming up underneath as the lettuces are growing. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll do that block. I'll, I'll, you know, till up the block, make the beds and turn the water on before we've planted anything. Right. So it's sort of pre emerge pre preceding, get the, uh, get them to come up. And um, early in the year, it's a little bit more difficult, but then once it gets going, it works, it works pretty well. And uh, the, the, uh, on the mounted on the tractor flame weeder, um, I really like. And I've heard from other growers about um, 
I can't remember the name, but this fabric, uh, kind of a plasticky fabric that lays down. And uh, I just learned about this. Doing like the silage, the silage tarps. Yes, exactly. Uh, thank you. Exactly. But we haven't done that. I've been, we've been doing this um, framer method, but it works and it works pretty well. Uh, works really well if all the, if all the timing is right. Well, and again, I think you said the the one of the advantages you have about farming in a place like Missoula is that the mm. having the timing be right is really up to you guys. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the, since we really don't get much in the way of rain, um, it's all about having our stuff dialed, and and for the most part, that works. Now you said you guys also do a lot of bunched greens for your wholesale market and for the Western Montana Growers Cooperative. So, yeah. so. What can you tell me about doing those and making that efficient on your scale? Because, you know, when you talk about farming in that, you know, six mm -hmm. to eight acres, mm -hmm. you're not big enough that you're taking advantage of huge economies of scale. And you're also beyond yeah. that point where you're like, you know, a little tiny farm where you guys are doing a lot of the work yourself and are able to make sure that, you know, those that when Kim's out there working three times as fast as everybody else is, that, that yeah. that's actually setting the pace. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little bit tricky, and um, you know, we've, we've hoped to get good workers, and uh, and what what we told the people who work for us is that uh, quality go comes first, and speed will come later, and that the people who buy our food do so because it's beautiful. Uh, they're into local. Uh, they're they're psyched that it was done in a sustainable way. We're not certified. Um, so we're going to, we, we're, we're toying with the idea of getting certified this year, but for years we haven't been certified, which is another interesting thing to talk about. Um, though we don't use any chemicals, we grow in a, in a, in a, in a way that's consistent with certification, but the people who buy our food aren't really interested in any of that. What they want is that it's, they want it to be gorgeous. So for us making kale bunches and collard bunches and charred bunches, they have to be beautiful. And we really stress that and model that and, uh, Look carefully. It's what at, at how the harvest go, uh, and then the idea is that as people go, they learn to go faster. And we try and teach them the tricks of going faster. That you, know, you can kind of put these things under your arms as you go, and you can drag a box. And you don't walk back and forth, and keep your rubber bands on your hand or your twist ties, or depending on which way you're doing it, and you know, be efficient. But uh, it behooves us to show to model the right behavior and to be in the thick of it, and to hire good people, and then to trust them once they are on their feet and empower them. Now, I mean, you guys are a seasonal business. You're not keeping people on yes. over the winter. And, right. and you're oftentimes off of the farm, at least off of the Clark right. Fork Organics farm. I mean, that must leave a lot on Kim's shoulder as far as modeling good oh, behavior. Oh, for sure. For sure, yeah. Um, it does. It does. Yeah, I mean, this is her deal. I'm here part of the time. She's here all the time. It, it definitely does. And, you know, we end up typically hiring um, young people who are in college or right out of college uh, because of where we are in Montana. We don't have a, pro, a group of folks who are truly professional farm workers like you might have in many other parts of the country. Um, so we end up hiring kind of interns or apprentices. And uh, these are people who are really interested in doing this type of work, maybe doing this as a livelihood, but, you know, maybe they've never most, most of them haven't done it before. So our expectations are not that they're going to be great at it right away, but that they're going to try really hard and listen and learn and be open. Uh, so it does behoove Kim to model and talk through it and teach and mentor. And she's done a great job of that. And uh, really fortunate. And then we look around the landscape on there and find there are people who worked with us that now have their own farms that are fabulously successful. And it's really great to still have them in our lives and people who've done that and moved to faraway places who are farming. So we've, we've been able to plant the seeds that started other farms. And that's kind of a great thing. Do you feel like there's things that you've done as managers that have helped to plant those mm -hmm. seeds? Yeah, I do. Um, so the way that we structure the work here, we are all in it together. And what I've told people who are applying for jobs, that this isn't a job where uh, – you do your work and then you close the door on your work and then you go home. And that could like you would if you were a teacher or a banker or, or anything. The, this isn't a job really. It, it's a way of life and the work and the farm and the life inside of our house, all of it are very intertwined. And 
coming here for the summer is a chance to try on that life and see how it feels. As, as, as a, one of the ways we make that a reality is that we eat together five nights a week. So for our workers, part of their pay is they get dinner and I make them dinner. So we, you know, I come home from the peace farm and join in a little bit. Uh, then I come in and make dinner and then we're all eating, you know, it could be anywhere from seven o'clock to nine o'clock at night. We eat dinner together. And I think that really drives it home that this is a way of life. It's not a job with a cutoff time where you're punching a clock or something. Uh, and for some people, they really become intoxicated with this way of life. And then they want to go do it on their own. And for other people, they're like, that was a cool thing. And I'm going to go do something else. So I feel like the eating together and eating the food that we've been growing and all of us being in it together kind of sets a stage. So when you talk about eating with your employees at seven o'clock yeah. or even nine o'clock at night, yeah. What kind of yeah, hours are yeah. you guys keeping on the farm? So um, in the summertime, in the heat of the summer, we might start. If it's really hot, we're going to start maybe sometime between 7 and 7.30. If it's not as hot, we'll start around 8. And they, they you know, borrowed some of this parlance from some of our friends. Is it a hard 8 or is it a soft 8? You know? And then we don't end at a specific time, but we end when a certain work is done. So with the Good Food Store, the major natural food grocery store nearby us, uh, we grow a lot of scallions for them and we deliver the scallions to them three times a week. And it's the last thing we do at the end of the day. So they get harvested earlier in the day, put in a cooler, and then we bring them out at the end of the day and uh, bundle and wash. And the bundling and washing are kind of sitting in a semicircle in the shade, usually listen to uh, NPR or a podcast or something. And that's the last thing we do. And if that ends at six o'clock, then we're eating at six. If it ends at eight, then we're eating at eight. Uh, so, and we tell people, we're just, this is, this is, you're getting a taste of the whole deal. And, and this is, this is what it is. Uh, Tuesdays, we do a, a restaurant delivery and we're done a bit earlier. So Tuesdays is a much more reasonable time. And then Fridays, we're getting ready for market. So it goes on a little bit longer um, and it's more intense, but the, the hours are long, but our season is short. And I think that's a really key thing. Like, like I said, I first cut my teeth farming in Santa Cruz and you could do it you know, year round for sure. And sort of summer style farming nine months, right. And for us, the heat of the year, the heat of the season is like three months long. So though the days are long and super fast paced and at times it feels like this is totally insane. Just about the time you've digested that and feel like you can't take it anymore. It's over. So it's, it's, it's pretty short. I was going to comment because one of the themes that has come out in the podcast, although, you know, it's, it's not mm -hmm. a universal thing. It has been about, you know, people limiting work hours. It's something that's come up a lot, but so you guys aren't really limiting the work hours as much as you are limiting the work season. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. The season itself is pretty darn short and the intense time of the season is even shorter. So during that, it's just like that old, old farming adage where you make, Hey, well, the sun shines. Well, for us, we've got this, you know, about, I'd say like mid June to, uh, you know, early, early September where we're going as fast as possible. And we just, and then after that, we don't. And because you can't, the weather, the climate doesn't allow. So during that little chunk of time, we're going full on. You know, I was going to say, Josh, that, that, that whole thing about making hay while the sun shines, that's, that's a Midwestern yeah. statement where sometimes <laughs> the sun isn't shining yeah. in the summertime. It really wasn't designed for Western Montana where the sun shines right. all summer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're right. All right. Like just just want to be clear about that there. Okay. So, sure. um, <laughs> all right. You mentioned your irrigation system and yeah, you, I, I liked what you said because to me, that's how irrigation worked on the vegetable farms that I started farming on was with these mm -hmm. 30 foot, two inch aluminum pipes yeah, with, yeah, with, the, with the, with the risers, you know, a two foot riser yeah. and a rain bird sprinkler going ch Right, think, exactly. That's, that's what we got. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's mm -hmm. interesting because you don't see a lot of that out on vegetable farms these days. You know, these, these hand oh, really? lines that are getting moved. Yeah. When I go around, that's especially here in the upper Midwest, it's not what I'm seeing on a regular wow. basis. What are, you, what are you seeing? I see people trying to do all kinds of, you know, things with drip and traveling irrigation guns and, and, you wow. know, various Jimmy together setups. Um, but, uh -huh. but not, I mean, the hand line doesn't seem to be such a such a popular item as maybe it was 20 years ago. And as maybe as it is wow. out in the mountains or out as it is out in the Intermountain West, where, you know, you, you're yeah. using very similar equipment for doing irrigation of hay fields. And, you know, and you've got the wheel yep. lines out there and things like that. 
Um, yeah, you, you're totally, totally accurate with that. And it's really, this irrigation is really common out here, not just with uh, vegetable farmers, but with hayfields too. It's, and, and I think one of the reasons we use it and so many other people use it is because it has a tradition here. So I can get the gear locally. And if we need more gaskets, I can run down the store, run down the road and get some gaskets. It's, it's, all, it's all readily available. And I love that. Uh, one of the, I love a bunch of things about irrigating this way. And one of them is that the pipes don't break unless you run over them. They're there for just about forever. You know, the, the, you can replace some rubber gaskets and the nozzles on the rainbirds kind of get eroded and hollow out every you know, handful of years. You can replace them. But for the most part, they're fairly permanent. Other things I really like about them is that you can hear if something is wrong and you can see if something is wrong from quite a distance. It, it, unlike with drip, where uh, it's, you really have to go check to find it. I mean, I can be walking by the field and I can hear if something is not right. I can be driving by a field and see a di- away in the distance that oh, one of those birds is clogged. I also like that repairing these things, they're so simple. There's such a small set of things that can go wrong. Uh, they're pretty easy to fix. On the downside, though, I mean, they shoot water everywhere, and you don't necessarily need water everywhere, which makes drip uh, a, a more desirable thing. But like I was saying earlier, we're really rich in groundwater. Uh, we have a fantastic network of irrigation ditches and rivers and creeks and lakes, so we're not in a water shortage situation where our drip makes a lot it is an imperative. And, and not so concerned about losing a lot of moisture to evaporation. Well, we put on a lot of water, so we lose some, but it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, I mean, and, and I guess another situation where um, uh, overhead irrigation might be bad is in a place where you've got high humidity. Um, and I'm only guessing because I haven't lived in these places, but if high humidity where fungal rots and diseases are really a problem and all that excess water would, would work against you. But for us, like I said, we've, you know, hot sun, wind, and next to no humidity, it, it doesn't really matter. We're not... Uh, we're not in that situation. So we do in our, in our high tunnels, we do drip. And with irrigation being a way of life for you, because yeah. you, I mean, I, I'm assuming that you never wait for the rain. It's just, it's, you're always irrigating, right? Oh, hundred percent. You're totally correct. Yeah. We are, we're like I said, we're sort of ruled by these planting schedules. We're also ruled by our irrigation schedules, we're moving pipe all the time. Um, and actually we don't move pipe as much as we used to. We buy a little bit every year and we, don't have to move it as much as we used to, but we're turning water on and moving openers and uh, chunks of handline um, elbows or uh, uh, tees or that sort of thing. Um, it's it's happening every couple hours, all day, every day, <laughs> seven days a week for the heat of the season. It's definitely a part of life. Any tricks or tips that you found, especially for making the system work for you? Yeah, I mean, one thing that's been, and this sounds kind of like a luxury, but over time, we we bought a little bit of pipe every year, so we haven't made gigantic purchases all at once when we didn't have much money, um, but we got to a point now after doing it for so many years and continually buying a little bit of pipe and being on the lookout for used pipe that's decent, that now we don't have to spend so much time moving pipe because a lot of the field is kind of plumbed. And Earlier, like when we started 20 some odd years ago, we didn't, you know, we only had a little pipe and we moved it a lot. And I think that was okay. Um, I miss, to some degree, I miss moving pipe as much as we used to, uh, but I also don't miss it. So I guess the tip is to buy a little <laughs> pipe regularly if this is your way to go. And uh, eventually you don't have to move it so much. Um, there, there's probably some larger lesson in life. Right there. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a, yeah, and, and it sort of fits with the trajectory of, of existence in the sense that we were substituting energy for uh, for stuff uh, early on, and now there's not as much energy, and there's more stuff in, it, in terms of more pipe and less of us running around, and that seems to work out fine. I mean, it's okay. I really like showing people how to move pipe. It's really empowering, especially for young people who are unaccustomed to things that look big and industrial and intimidating and realizing how it's not intimidating. There's a great, some great lessons in moving irrigation pipe and that it looks like they're going to be heavy and you have to be strong and carry this burden. And it's really about balance. It's not about strength, it's about carrying irrigation pipe and you can put one on each shoulder and, and you can be, and you can move quite efficiently and you just have to use your head. And 
I think there's some good lessons to be learned about all things in that. All right, Josh, I think this is a great place to stop. We're going to get a quick word from yeah. our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Josh Slotnick from a lot of different places, but mostly we've been talking about <laughs> Clark Fork Organics. Right. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. A BCS two-wheel tractor is the only power equipment a market gardener will need with PTO-driven attachments like the rototiller, the flail mower, the power harrow, the rotary plow, the snow floor, the log splitter, and more. You name it, and you can probably run it with a versatile BCS two-wheel tractor. The first time I used a rototiller way back in 1991, it was mounted to a BCS two-wheel tractor, and it spoiled me for life. When you get behind a BCS, you can tell that it's built to the same commercial standards as four-wheel farm tractors, and it has many of the same features. I've used other tillers and mowers, and I've spent most of that time thinking how much easier this job would be with a BCS. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. Perennial support is also provided by Vermont Compost Company, makers of living potting soils for organic growers since 1992. In the transplant greenhouse, all of your investment in plant material, heat, labor, and overhead depend absolutely on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And that media has a really hard job to do, produce a healthy plant in just a few cubic centimeters of soil. When I started farming, I focused on getting the cheapest ingredients I could to make my own potting soil, and later on finding cheap potting soil already put together. But I found out what so many farmers have, that saving money on inputs doesn't always result in increased profits. Jennifer at Vermont Compost can tell story after story of customers who switch to less expensive options, but who have come back to Vermont Compost Company for the consistency and the quality of their potting soils. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com And we're back with Josh Slotnick of a whole lot of different places in Missoula, Montana. Josh, we've been talking about your home farm, Clark Fork Organics, but you also noted in, in the introduction here that you started in 1996 with Garden City Harvest, which is associated with the University of Montana and, and has this peas farm that you manage. And, and I, I want you to kind of sort all that out for us. I'm not going to try to sure, do it yeah. myself. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for asking. because it, it is a, a whole mess of things to be unraveled. So you're right. In 1996, with a couple other people, I was able to help start this food security nonprofit here called Garden City Harvest. And Garden City Harvest now operates a network of neighborhood farms. These are farms in city limits who exist to meet a food security need, growing high-quality food for low-income people, but also have a role to play in education around ecologically conscious food production. And we also use our sites for a personal restoration of youth and adults. So the interaction with the university, I think, is really powerful and unique and that we together, the university, the environmental studies program at the university where I'm on the faculty and Garden City Harvest team up to run a 10 acre vegetable farm right here in city limits. It's kind of unusual to have a 10 acre farm inside a city. This work, the work on the farm is done by the most part by university students who are taking a class called the Peas Supervised Internship and I'm the teacher. Garden City Harvest, the nonprofit, covers all the operating expenses for the farms. That means the tractor, the fuel for the tractor, insurance, seeds, everything, all the stuff that's associated with a, a large-scale vegetable farm, they buy that. And the land is owned by the Missoula County Public School District and then leased to the city of Missoula on a 40-year lease. And the city has a 40-year lease with the nonprofit Garden City Harvest. So it's definitely a, a, a multi-level partnership. And what comes out of this is that we grow tens of thousands of pounds of vegetables for our local food bank. And we also host a program for uh, uh, at-risk youth and uh, a program for elementary school kids. And we have a hundred member CSA and we get thousands of children coming up on field trips. Uh, and this university program is there. Right? There's nearly a hundred university kids a year getting a little bit of experience working on a vegetable farm. And the community is it's part, I feel like it's become part of the fabric of the community over the last 20 years. Tell me a little bit about more about how that farm actually works on a day-to-day -day basis. Who's sure, besides yeah. yourself, who's staffing the farm and how, how yeah. are you actually pumping out all those vegetables? Yeah. So for the most part, that's me and a group of university students. And we have a few other staff members from Garden City Harvest as well. So, but the students are really doing the brunt of the, of the, hard work. And we started at the end of February. So we're going right now 
uh, even though there's snow on the ground, we're working in our greenhouse and hoop house and pruning in an apple orchard and we've got other maintenance tasks. The students are there from this semester. They're here with us until mid-May and then summer starts. And summer is really the heart of the peace farm and the heart of the academic program as well. It's not even really academic, but the school program. And we have students there Monday through Thursday working from eight to noon. And then at noon, we eat lunch together. And I stole this right out of the UC Santa Cruz farm and garden model, uh, where two students make food for everybody else out of the food, we, food we've been growing. And this way they get to eat what we've been growing and also learn to cook for a group. And it's just a great thing to work all morning and then roll into the barn and have lunch laid out for you. So Monday through Thursday, we work together in the morning, meet lunch on Fridays. Uh, I teach a class on bugs or weeds or soil or something like that on Friday mornings. And then we go on a field trip to visit a farm in the area. And like I was saying earlier, we have this really rich local food scene now. So there are grain farms, ranches, fruit orchards, vegetable farms, and all kinds of everything else uh, that we get to go see. And so the students, they do this in a fairly contrived way at the peas farm. Monday through Thursday. And then on Fridays, we get to go meet people who are doing it as livelihood. And the people we meet are really open and candid, and that's really fantastic. So students get to hear about what, what really this is like to do it uh, on a, in a real way for, for your livelihood. And then twice a week in the afternoons, we have students who stay in the afternoon and help us out getting ready for CSA. And our CSA is super traditional. It's not the um, you get a box at a drop-off point. It's that people come to our farm and we have all the food laid out for them in our barn on this long, beautiful table. And there's a person checking them in and then a person stocking the table and the customers get to hear from the person who's checking them in and see on a sign, oh, today you get to take one bunch of carrots, one bunch of beets and three pounds of potatoes or whatever. And they go through the line and they fill up their bag. Uh, and having those 100 CSA members means we have another 100 advocates in the community, and it also generates a chunk of money that helps keep the farm going each year. And and I'm always curious in situations like this. Do you guys worry about the mm -hmm. competition that you're presenting to the other farmers in the area? Oh, it's a great, that is a great question, and it's in our, our bylaws that we don't sell at farmer's market, that we don't sell to restaurants or grocery stores, that we just do this CSA. And there are Given that there are you know, 75,000 people in the city, 100,000 in the county, our 100-member CSA doesn't really affect uh, much in the way of, of local competition. And we're part of our local farmers group, um, the homegrown group. Uh, that's, what, that's what we're called. And I feel like it's really important for us to be part of all that. But competition is a big issue, so we've just steered clear, but we don't sell to grocery stores, restaurants, or the growers co-op. Um, if we do sell something, it's because nobody else is doing it. So like, like if we have an excess of onions and all the other growers have sold all their onions to the growers co-op and to the, our major net, uh, uh, to the good food store, we'll be the last one in line and you know do some providing that way. But that's barely anything. For the most part, we just don't sell anything other than our CSA. And about how much of your produce is going to the CSA and how much is heading towards the food banks? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. I feel like it's, I'm going to guess maybe it's 60, 40 by weight uh, CSA to food bank. Uh, the big difference is the diversity and the CSA gets a lot more diversity. And we've worked pretty closely with our food bank in a similar way to that we'd worked with uh, the restaurants that we, the CFO works with. And then we were in good touch with them and trying to figure out so what do food bank clients, food bank customers, what do they want and what can, what can we provide and how can we help really work with the food bank? And what we found is that we could do a handful of crops in large quantity that don't require refrigeration that people fully understand. So we do lots and lots of onions because the food bank is a warehouse. They can stash the onions. After they're cured, we bag them up and give them to the food bank. And then the food bank can give them out all throughout the fall without having to take up cooler space. We do a similar thing with the food bank in that we provide them with a whole lot of winter squash. Again, it doesn't require refrigeration. And, uh, and then the other one we do, and we do a lot of carrots. And that one does require refrigeration, but it's something that everybody knows what to do with. And this is a super sad thing here. I'm going to go off on a little bit about uh, food culture and poverty. And that when we started, I 
was quite naive in this. And I thought, well, if we grow beautiful food like chard and kale, these gorgeous greens that are so good for you, and we give them to the food bank, then we're going to meet this nutritional need that right now is falling off, that people who don't have a lot of money can't afford to buy fresh kale and chard. Right. And I found that it's a lot more complicated than that. And that there are, just as there's sort of generational poverty, with that poverty comes an understanding of what food is. And if a person has grown up their whole life eating canned and microwave food, presenting them chard does not mean they're going to eat the chard. They're going to look at it and say, what is this? And how do you eat it? And what am I supposed to do with this? And then after you leave, they might just throw it in the garbage because it doesn't look like food. It just flat out doesn't look like food. So for us to work really effectively with the food bank uh, as a provider, not, not as in a sort of programmatic way, but as a provider, it behooves us to get people food that they understand is food and are going to be excited to eat. So it doesn't end up in the dumpster. Less radicchio so and more carrots. Yeah. 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 So when you started the peas farm in 1996, yeah. was that something that, that it took time to learn or was that something that was pretty obvious oh. right off the bat? Man, it, it took some time to learn. We were really, really naive. And, and, uh, Part of our naivete is excusable in that this sort of thing wasn't happening. I mean, right now there are fantastic community agriculture and food security organizations in every city in America. It's a great thing. When we started, there wasn't much of this, so there wasn't a whole lot to learn from. We were kind of in uncharted territory, so we made a whole bunch of mistakes. Uh, and and learning, learning the ropes was a, was a, <laughs> had to happen. So for us, really, that meant figuring out how to work closely with the food bank and grow food that people would want. And, uh, and that's, that's helped a lot. Other thing that, that I really, that I learned that I sort of knew, but couldn't have put words to back then was that so much of the good part of what we do isn't in the provision of food, but it's in the act of growing food together and the community that forms when we're growing food together and the learning lessons that happen there. I think that's some of the most powerful things that we've stumbled into. And uh, this happens with university students, but it also happens with our youth program. Uh, and now we have a, a, a whole youth farm. You know, it started with the Peace Farm, but now we have four neighborhood farms, each which sort of occupy a separate type of niche of service. But in all these places, the act of, food, of growing food together, the, the work itself brings people together in ways that don't happen in most other contexts. And we found to be really special and really kind of have a profound effect on people. Tell me a little bit more about the other farms. And you talk about four different neighborhood farms, each, each with a little bit of different programming. Yeah. Yeah. We have four farms and this is, I'm just amazed that this has occurred and, and I'm, I deserve little, very little credit in this. I did my part and other people joined on in on this. And if I did anything, it was basically get out of their way. Well, they helped create these other things. So we have, uh, the River Road Farm, which is now our headquarters, we're in the act of, of building new uh, a new office space there. And this is a huge multi-million dollar project with offices and barns, and it's really quite amazing. And we own that land. This is one of the only places that the nonprofit Garden City Harvest actually owns. So River Road, I think River Road's main service activity is through a program we call Volunteer for Veggies. So there's a CSA, and the CSA helps fund it all. But people can come work at River Road and trade their time for vegetables. And we get you know, thousands of volunteer hours spent on this. And the volunteer hours certainly help us in that we can meet the needs of the CSA. But they really help the people who are volunteering and the folks who come and volunteer walk away with food. And this is different than having a community garden plot where somebody has to decide, okay, I'm going to be committed and rent this plot and, and, and I'm going to grow my own food on this plot. This is where somebody says, you know, I don't know if I can – handle that level of a seasonal commitment, but I have two hours I can give on Thursdays and they come and work, work at river road with our, our farmer there, Greg price and trade their time for food. And literally we get hundreds of people putting in thousands of hours from all walks of life, but mostly they are low and moderate income people and they get to trade their time for good food. And when they're there, their idea around food, like I was saying before, how poverty, there's culture of food that is attached to poverty that gets broken down because they're working in it. And it, it's really different to provide someone here, have a bunch of chart. It's another thing to be involved in the growing of that chart. And then you're going to want to eat it. And I feel like we've had a great effect on changing people's food lives through personal interaction with, uh, with growing up food. And that happens at River Road. 
than some of the other farms. We have a farm called the Youth Farm that we run in partnership with an organization called Youth Homes here in Missoula, and they provide group homes for kids whose families have, uh, for one reason or another, have kind of imploded and weren't able to take care of the kids. One of the homes, the Tom Roy Youth Guidance Home, has a couple acres behind it. Garden Seed Harvest partnered up with Youth Homes to run a farm and employ kids who live in uh, Tom Roy Youth, Youth Home. And these kids work on the farm, meet the needs of the CSA, and they do this amazing thing, possibly one of the best things we do, uh, called Mobile Market. And we do this at, uh, with our youth program, the Peace Farm, too, where teenagers harvest vegetables and then take this, these vegetables in a big panel truck off to low-income housing for senior citizens. And then they set up what look like mock uh, farmer's markets in the parking lot of the, of the housing open at a specific time and then the seniors kind of flood out and buy the food. And this is really amazing in that it meets meets such an obvious need. We're talking about low income older people for whom transportation is difficult and they don't have a lot of money. And they actually do know what to do with fresh vegetables. So for these folks to have the food land right right in their parking lot is spectacular. And then they buy the food, which I feel like for the people we're talking about is really important. It's not a, a donation drop off. It's uh it's sold by teenagers at what looks like a farmer's market. But because it's our food, we subsidize it. That means we can charge whatever we want for it. So nothing's more than a dollar. And in, in this way, we're, we're kind of circumventing the, the economically fiery local food market in dealing with low-income old people, older people. They pay a you know, dollar and they walk away with a beautiful bunch of beets. And really importantly, when they're buying these beets, they're buying them from teenagers. Teenagers who, for some of whom, have been in trouble, some of whom uh, don't have function, high-functioning families, teenagers who have been basically in the way of adults to some degree or another or in a system. Right. So we've got these seniors receiving these teenagers really like, like they're heroes, like they're really special people because the teenagers are bringing these folks right to their doorstep, really, this gorgeous, spectacular food, and setting it up in, in this very welcoming farmer's market style uh, environment where the seniors have to buy the stuff. So it's not a drop off donation. The seniors get to, they buy it. But like I said, it's, we, it's our food, our I meaning garden city harvest food. So we subsidize it. So we decide, Oh, we're going to charge, you know, nothing more than a dollar. So the seniors can buy this gorgeous food at really a, a quite reasonable prices. And in so doing interact with the teenagers in the same way that people interact with me at farmer's market. And it's, Really amazing. Um, I've described this in other places before as kind of a social ecology. And I use the word ecology because in a, in a biological ecology, one, the way one organism lives kind of creates a niche for another one. In this social ecology, you've got a similar thing where we, the needs that these two groups of people have are met beautifully by the other. So these seniors need to be tended to, need to be noticed, needed to be reminded that they are vital and alive and, and worthy of attention. And the teenagers need to be doing something where they are recognized as being meaningful. And so these two groups fit together perfectly, where the teenagers can provide the service, bring the food, tend to the senior citizens, and the senior citizens through their responses are demonstrating to the teenagers how meaningful they are. And both groups just shine because of it. And how many teens are you involving in this program? Because this is really interesting so, to me. Yeah, it's super good stuff. I think there are, and this is small scale. So at the youth farm, I think they're employing, uh, you know, between four and six a season. And, and our youth harvest program at the Peace Farm, we, we also do a mobile market. We're employing you know, eight, let's say eight to ten is kind of where we, where we land uh, each season. So this is definitely a program where, it's quality over quantity where a small group of people have a undergo a, a fairly transformative experience. And is this something that, that kids are volunteering for? How do you, how do you recruit people into a program like this? Oh, it's a great question. Great question. No, they're paid. They're paid. Uh, so we, when we describe this, we call it a um, therapeutic job training program. So for at least, let's say for the kids who are in our youth harvest program at the peace farm, where some of them come from Missoula Youth Drug Court and some of them don't. Uh, for a lot of these kids, there is not a good model of employment. They haven't had a job. They're just kids. And the adults in their lives are 
often, often not gainfully employed or not employed in a way that we would recognize as such. So these kids don't have a model for job experience. So they come to do this thing at the Peace Farm. They get paid, uh, a min- they get paid minimum wage, uh, and they work on the farm. They work side by side with university students, with community members, but they also have a whole bunch of youth development activity that's built into their week. And the people that run this program are really experts in positive youth development. So all kinds of leadership training and customer service training and training on how to be in a workplace. And also we, they get really learned up on our food systems. They become kind of micro experts on our food, on our food system. By the end of the summer, one of our goals is that they can speak articulately about the work they do and how our food system functions. So it's, they get paid, but it's more than a job. And in terms of recruitment, we work closely with Missoula Youth Drug Court and with the Youth Homes Organization. And these entities spread the word, and then kids apply for the job, and then our staff interviews and makes choices. And you started doing this work fairly early on in your farming career. Yeah, yeah. So, gosh, I mean, I'd, we've been farming. Kim and I have been farming together for maybe three, four years. Well, let me see. You know, our first Garden City Harvest season was in the season of 97, so when we started in 92. So I guess five years. And when Garden City Harvest started, we didn't have a youth program. Uh, we just, when we started, we had one two-acre farm and two community gardens. And these other programs grew as more people joined on with us, and these other people had great ideas and kind of ran with them. So and that's how we got uh, got the youth program and the and the mobile market with seniors. One of the latest ones I feel like is super interesting, and this one I don't have anything to do with. It's just part of our organization. Uh, is we're working with uh, some doctors at the VA and with another hospital here in a program we call Prescription Vegetables, where doctors have basically said written a prescription. These are for mostly for vets and for other people who are suffering from kind of lifestyle diseases. Okay, here's a prescription. You can cash this prescription in at, and this is one of the other four farms. We have a couple orchard gardens farm, which is on the grounds of a um, low income housing. And you can take this prescription to orchard gardens twice a week. They have a, a farm stand and you can trade your prescription in for vegetables so that you can deal with some of the issues around diabetes, et cetera. And this is our second year. Last year was a pilot year. And now we have two sites for this and uh, a set of doctors involved and it should be poised to take off. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like one of the, one of the real criticisms of the local food movement is that it's kind of elitist and it's only for people who have, who have money. And one of the missions of Garden City Harvest is to make sure that everyone, regardless of income, has access to this high quality food. Now, starting this when your farm was still young, I, uh, yeah, can't have been easy, and it, it can't be easy to balance all of this because you've got a lot on your plate. <sighs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You're totally right on that, and uh, uh, it's just been my life for a long time. Um, and uh, you know, yeah, it's not one in balance. For a good six months out of the year, I work every day, which for a lot of people would be insane. Um, it just, it just kind of is for me, and I don't know, if, you know, for how many more years can I keep doing this? I don't know. It's been tremendously rewarding. I think that's, it's been my life. It's, it hasn't been my job. It's, it's been what my life is. And I feel so fortunate to have had that. So it is crazy, but it's good. Is that something that causes tension at home? I mean, you've got a wife, you've got kids. I mean, I can't. Have... Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For sure. and, and I think our, uh, there's a cost to all of this. You know, there's that the classic opportunity cost. If you're in one place, it means you can't be somewhere else, right? And um, our family farm has a certain character and functions a certain way. And part of that's because things I do, I don't do as timely in a timely way as I should, um, because I'm off doing these other things. Um, and and doing these other things has provided us, uh, provided me, kind of a richness to my life that wouldn't otherwise exist. And all these people that I know that have become part of our family farm and then really boring, but important things like health insurance. So it's in it, you know, way back when I never, ever would have guessed that Garden City Harvest and the environmental studies programs, Peas Farm would have become as big as they are 
And I wouldn't have guessed that our family farm would have become as established and as big as it is. And it, all these things just grew. And right against this backdrop of it was family and children. We have three kids that are all mostly grown up right now, but they grew up in the thick of all of this. And I think it was a great way for them to grow up uh, in this kind of semi-controlled chaos. Um, it, seeing who the, the, we still have a 17 year old who's around, uh, the other two are off. Uh, and you can see it in the choices they've made that this kind of the community and food and being involved and having a conscience about things are really important. It's become who they are. And I, and I'm, I like to think that how they grew up made some of that possible. You know, a lot of times when I talk to farmers and especially people who have work long hours, have very busy lives, yeah. one of the regrets yeah. that they bring up is, is not mm -hmm. having the time for the kids, but you're actually talking about the, the busyness in your life actually being something good for the kids. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I mean, if I, I would love talking about this and at the same time, I almost get choked up because it's so, uh, so in my heart. Uh, um, I remember a long, this is a long time ago. I think it must've been my son was like in sixth grade and um, we were at school and they had poems up on the wall that they'd written. And uh, he'd written a poem about he and I moving irrigation pipe together. Back then we didn't have as much pipe. We had to move pipe a lot. And, and it was this beautiful little poem about us having this conversation while moving to pipe. And I, you know, had been having these thoughts about, uh, you know, do we have enough time for the kids and other people go on vacations with their children? And I thought, no, I moved pipe with my son. And uh, that's, was that moving pipe or was that parenting? Or it's all rolled together. It's just life. And we weren't separate from one another the way if I worked at an insurance agency or I don't mean to say bad things about insurance agencies, but if my whole life was outside of our house, we would actually have had less time together than having our kids be part of our family farm where our kids, you know, harvest things as they got older, they became more a uh, part of the work and the harvest and uh, working farmer's market. And were just in the thick of it with us and got to learn some of their own value and the times I spent with my kids working were great, were, were maybe even better than if we'd been on vacation because they got to see their value to our whole family enterprise. So it's, and that's totally with them, even to this day, the ones who, my son's about 24 now, and he teaches pre-K and kindergarten. And uh, I think the work ethic and the care and the part of community all helped him become who he is. And I have another daughter who's a second year in college in Vermont and then a 17 year old daughter who's in high school here. Josh, with that, we're going to turn to our lightning round. First, we're going to get a quick yeah. word from one more sponsor and then we'll be right back. This lightning round and this episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmers Web, software for your farm. Farmers Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time, increasing efficiency, reducing mistakes and streamlining order management from start to finish. No more lost order slips and invoices. Know which of your buyers have already paid and which have not. Keep records and download your financial data. Farmers Web helps you manage orders from buyers who place them online, as well as those that order by phone, text, or email. Save time and reduce errors by keeping all of your orders in one place, automatically generating harvest and pick lists, product catalogs, and packing slips. Farmers Web helps inform your buyers of delivery routes, pickup locations, lead times, and order minimums while also helping you keep track of buyer payment terms, special pricing, and customer information for all your buyers. A flat monthly fee and flexible plan types allow you to pause, cancel, or switch plan types from month to month at any time, even during the off-season. Farmersweb.com. All right, and Josh, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Favorite tool? Jeez. Wow. Oh, man. I if the tractor is a tool, I can say that. If not, I'm going to say harvest knife. Yeah, we'll let the tractor be a tool. What kind of tractor do you guys have? Okay. Uh, a Kubota 4630. So it's, it's a moderate size tractor, um, 47 horsepower, roughly 40 at the PTO. Um, we use a spader as a our primary tillage tool, and I really love the hydrostatic transmission and the ability to uh, independently adjust forward speed and uh, the RPMs at the PTO. Like it's just brilliant design. Great. And what's your favorite crop to grow? Favorite crop to grow. Man, that's a hard one too. God, I got to go with seasonally. There's got to be one for each season. Kim and I were just talking about this the other day. I'm going to say one of my favorite things to harvest is celery because when you cut it, it looks like chaos and then you trim it back and it's beautiful. 
<laughs> like that. Um, and, and because you are so busy, what's the last purely recreational activity you did? I uh, played pond hockey. Okay. So that was a while ago. No, that wasn't a while last, ago. Well, last weekend. Yeah. Last weekend. Last weekend. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sorry. It's, it, things are, things are, have, have warmed up exceptionally fast here in Wisconsin this year. And, and the ice yeah. has gone off the lake. So I'm thinking pond hockey is not a thing around here, even no, though it should fact, be normal. There, there was a game uh, at my friend, Steve Moosey at Lifeline farm at there. They have the pond. And I think it was uh, on Tuesday they had a game, but mom, I was working. <laughs> you were working. We had a long hockey, long, a long pond hockey season this year. All right. What's the best advice you've ever gotten? Man, oh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna quote uh, my buddy Steve at Lifeline's Farm when we were talking about infrastructure and where to put things, and I was trying to anticipate. Oh, we'll put this here and put that there, and he said, "No, you should just go slow, and let the rhythms of labor tell you where you're gonna put things, rather than try and make labor fit where you put stuff." Nah, that seems real. That's been smart in so many ways to go slow and let the rhythms of work determine how you organize yourself. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Maybe I would have said to uh, not worry about it so much and just keep at it and things will basically work out. The other one that stuck with me um, is when in doubt about what, what, what should I do, especially when you feel overwhelmed, there's six things you're supposed to do. Do what you know you're supposed to do and let the other stuff go out of your head. I would have told myself that then. Josh, thank you so much for a really rich interview here on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Wow, well, thank you, Chris. It's really fun and you ask great questions and it's fun to talk this stuff with someone who understands it right away. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 113 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Slotnick. That's S-L-O-T-N-I-C-K. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America, and by Rock Dust Local, the first company in North America specializing in local sourcing and delivery of the best rock dust and biochar for organic farming. Additional funding for transcripts provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show by going to farmer to farmer slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com. And I'll do my best to get them on the show. Josh Slotnick is one of the people that was recommended by you, my listeners. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.